Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And I know that hasn't been true for the last few weeks. <laughs> uh, but it's not because of laziness. It's because I've had so many things going on in preparation for my missions trip. And a lot of things going on here at the church's conferences and, and so forth. So... Um, and some well-needed vacation a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're back again, but we will not be here on Wednesday. I have another appointment that I need to get to in the morning. So, But this morning, we're here. And if you're in the neighborhood, you'd like to join us. Um, we normally are here Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So. And today we're starting a new uh, letter. It will be 2 Timothy. So if you want to grab your Bible and open it up, get your cup of coffee and a highlighter or a pen... I'll give you enough time. We'll go ahead and, and pray and ask the Lord to minister us, to us before we begin our day. Gracious Father in heaven, O oh Lord, how we understand and know that you are in total control, Father. For you know the beginning and you know the end. There's nothing that goes on in this world that you do not know of it, Lord. It does not surprise you at all. And Lord, you know the very heart of man and the motive before they even know their own motive and heart, Lord. And yet, Lord, your word says that even while we were still against you, sinners missing the mark, that you died on the cross for us. And so, Lord, all we need to do is truly just put our faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ alone. For there's nothing that we can do, otherwise we would boast in our own salvation. But Lord, it is all of you and none of us all we have to do is believe by faith and you say that you'll save us lord and thank you for writing our names in the book of life lord and we begin this monday morning lord just to seek your face to hear from your word and that you would minister to us and encourage us before we begin today in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. good morning uh diane glad you are joining us right now and there seems to be another person. Glad you're joining us. So I never know who's watching. Interesting. Uh, I was at a conference on Friday. That's why I wasn't here. And a dear brother, pastor, came up and he says, yeah, I've seen you on Facebook. And I've never seen his name on our uh, live stream. But he said he has seen through someone else that's on my friends list. And he saw it through their relationship, though he's not my friend. Not that he's not friendly or anything. <laughs> I'm not friendly, but we're just not friends in the sense that we haven't become friends on Facebook. It, we could be friends, but I don't know. He might not be a good friend, so maybe I don't want him as a friend. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, we're not friends at this point. But maybe one day we'll become friends. So anyway, all that to say, uh, you can join us anytime. So let's go ahead and, and look at Second Timothy chapter one. So the Apostle Paul is writing to young Timothy. So remember, young Timothy is, is loved very deeply by the Apostle Paul. Paul has poured into young Timothy. T Timothy has been with him for many years on mission trips, uh, thick and thin, through prosperity, through having impoverished. Uh, and Timothy has probably learned a lot through the Apostle Paul. But we're, we're never there, are we, in understanding God's Word. We're always growing and there's so much in it that, um, that we should continue to read it. I remember hearing Pastor Chuck at over 80 years old, and someone said if he had obtained yet, and he says, oh, he goes, not at all. He goes, I still need to understand so much more about the Bible and about the Lord. So you never can exhaust the Word of God, and you never stop learning. And in fact, I would venture to say that what we think we know is nothing. Nothing compared to what still needs to be known by the Lord. And what we know, we probably need to correct. And down the road, the Lord will correct. If I look back at some of the things I thought I knew, yeah. I really didn't know them. And I see the growth that God has done in my life at this point. So young Timothy, uh, a protege of Paul, a young minister in the ministry, definitely needs help. And encouragement. So Paul's writing to him from prison in Rome around 67 AD. 
Now, we all need encouragement. We all need fellowship. And if you're involved in a church, you really do need to have that fellowship within that church. You need to go to the church. You need to sit in the pews. You need to listen to the pastor. You need to participate in the fellowship of one another because we all need encouragement. Here's Timothy, a pastor of a church, and you think, oh, he, he's got it all handled. No, Paul, Paul wanted to encourage him and strengthen him in those areas that he needed strength because ministry is very difficult. Life is difficult and it's very hard and you need people to be praying for you and hopefully encouraging you through um, some means whatsoever. I love the fact that Calvary chapels understand that at the conference. Again, it was made clear that we're not a denomination and we're not somehow connected to one another through some sort of financial grid. We're men that God has called to be pastorates. And we're not even a fellowship. Uh, he said we're a family. And Calvary Chapel is a family. And you become family in, in the church that you're going to. And when you're family, you take care of one another. You take care of one another. You don't criticize and accuse and do all those things that we get enough of from the enemy from this world so so let's hear what paul has to say to young timothy here as he begins with a thanksgiving for timothy's faith so paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god according to the promise of life which is in christ jesus to timothy my beloved son grace mercy and peace from god the father of christ jesus our lord now observe that paul says that it's according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Promises all come from the Lord. And when the Lord promises something, he keeps his promise because God does not lie. In fact, when he makes a, a promise, he doesn't need to swear because there's no one higher than who he is. Amen. And so when he promises something, you can be assured that it will come true because he promised it to you. And so keep those promises close to you. And talk to God about the promises. There's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, you promised this. So give me patience to wait for the fulfillment of your promise in my life. Now here Paul is saying that, that his calling was from the promise of life in Christ Jesus. So it was Christ Jesus who promised Paul to become an apostle and a leader within the church. And a great leader he was in the ministry. Ministering to various churches throughout uh, that area there in Asia Minor and in Greece and in Israel and so forth. So he goes on and he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in, dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. So what, what a heritage right there, right? And a testimony that Timothy's faith uh, was evidence to the Apostle Paul, and he was greatly encouraged and thanked the Lord for it. And, and we need to observe that here, that he says, I thank God. Um, I thank God for the faith that is in Timothy. And started with his grandmother and then his mother. And so they handed that faith down to, to Timothy. Um, as uh, parents and grandparents, uh, they handed that heritage in a sense. And that takes some work, doesn't it? To train your children in a way that they would uh, receive your heritage of faith in Christ Jesus and then they would make it their own and then God would begin to use them. And that's how it really should work. So it is the responsibility of parents to train up their children in the way of the Lord. And how does that look? Well, I think it's different for every individual. It's interesting because Dave Rosales at a meeting the other day was, was sharing about how he taught his children how to tithe. And he said he would give them uh, dimes when he'd give them their allowance, which was a dollar or so. He'd give them a dime. He'd give them a, a bunch of dimes, 10 dimes. And he'd lay them out and say, here's your allowance. And this dime here belongs to the Lord, and those other dimes belong to you. And so it was a visual for, for them to see and go, wow, I get that many, and the Lord gets only one? Okay, I can, I can see that. I can handle that. Wow. And I told them, I go, that's interesting because 
You must have taught about that somewhere down the road because I remember hearing something like that years ago and I taught my children, you know, that they need a tie, that they get the 10 cents out of the dollar and the 90 goes to the Lord. And my children are, are tithers to this day because it's been handed down from Virginia and I to them and now they've made it their own and they see the benefits of it as the Lord has blessed them. So, um, yes, we have a responsibility uh, what that looks like, it's different for everyone. But I know that for us, personally, we taught our children by reading the Bible to them. Every night, by praying with them, taking them to church, uh, getting involved in church, serving in church. Uh, in the beginning, they were the ones setting up the chairs. They were the ones getting the sound system and the cassette recorders ready. And eventually they were the ones leading worship and then in the classroom and so forth. So these are all things that we as parents should do for our children, get them involved and not be running around all over the place. Can I say this and without hopefully pointing any fingers at anyone, but I think it's true in any church that there's always families that you see and that you love and that their children are a part of the children's ministry, but then you don't see them for months and months at a time. And it's sad because when you Unfortunately, we now live in social media years and social media, we love to post things. And so when you look at social media and you see what they're really doing and they're really just enjoying life like the world enjoys life and they're going to this party and that party and that beach and that mountain and that ski resort and all of this vacations and all of these things and you're wondering, why aren't they in church? And then when time goes by and their children are older and teens, they're having so many problems and yet you want to tell them, I can tell you why. You never made church a priority. Amen. You never made God first. It was always these other issues, which are, you know, um, valuable things. I mean, spending time with family, you're definitely, but you've got to somehow prioritize all of that for the sake of your children and for the sake of your own relationship. And, and yet, these families go on in life as though they're okay with Christ. And they are in the sense that Christ paid their debt, but their intimacy, their communion with God is not there. That's what is lacking. And that always grows, communion. Our, our stance with the Lord and our relationship is set because of what Christ did, not us. And so they're set and their salvation is there. But it's our communion with him that lacks. So we do have a responsibility. He goes on, he reminds uh, Timothy here of his responsibilities. Verse 6, therefore, so in light of of this praise and thanksgiving to the Lord and what the Lord has been doing through Timothy. He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. So God had given Timothy a gift and Paul was encouraging him to use that gift for the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> um, let me just explain this. Uh, really simply and hopefully uh, carefully and clearly. Uh, there's one God, and that God is Jesus Christ, Amen. the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is a trinity. God sends his Son to the earth to die for the sins of mankind. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, verse 6, and you can read it. If you have a Bible, look it up. Jesus himself says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. And so Jesus paid our debt. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ alone and in nothing else, then we are given salvation. He says, you'll be saved and you'll be sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, we're still here on earth. We haven't gone to heaven. So there's still work to be done. God then gives men and women gifts, gifts that they are to use within the body of Christ. That's why it's important to get involved in church. And these gifts are given to you. We all have different gifts. Some will be pastors, some will be Sunday school teachers, some will be precious people that just come early in the morning to set up tables and put all the groceries out so that others can you know, participate in, in getting groceries and meet their needs. So the gifts will vary. The important thing is using the gifts while we're here on this earth. And again, back to the families. They're not using the gifts, they're just enjoying life. So he's stirring Timothy up, be faithful with the gift that God has given you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now the word fear uh, can be interpreted servanthood, servanthood or bondage. God has not given us a spirit of bondage. 
um, but of power, power of the Holy Spirit, and of love, and of a sound mind, which means sober-mindedness. Now, this takes time <clears throat> because you have to experience uh, the Lord in your relationship with the Lord. As you seek him and as you're studying the Bible and reading the Bible, you're learning about him just like you would in any relationship. You know, you meet a, a person, a guy or a gal, and you don't assume anything because you don't know them. You have to spend time with them, get to know them, what they think, how they react, are they mean, are they fast-tempered, you know, and all of these things that you just get to know them. So you have to spend time. And once you spend time with them, once you get to know them, then then your reactions becomes, you know, to a certain place where whether you're reacting to their anger or whether you're reacting to their gentleness. And so by their actions, you react. So now take that. By the God's actions, we react. So when you read about God and how good he is, how loving, how caring, how he takes care of us, and that even if the world, some outside source, does something to us, God will defend us. Uh, even if they take our bodies, God says, I'll bring you to heaven. Amen. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to be in bondage to the fears and anxieties and stress because we know God has us in his hands completely and that he'll only allow us to go through what he wants us to go through to glorify him. Now that takes time. That takes time to understand. Um, it's taken me time to understand. And at this point, because of what I have endured, what I've experienced, you know, for me to go to a foreign country alone on an airport where you find Muslims and Hindis and, and people that are dangerous, you know, uh, I don't fear that. I don't have this fear of bondage. I can walk among them with confidence that the Lord has me right in his hand. Uh, it took me a while, you know, probably about three or four years to get rid of that fear, but it's because I've experienced God's faithfulness, you know, in that. Now, if I am in a situation where all of a sudden something very horrific is going to happen, I'm sure I'm going to get fearful, but I also believe that the Spirit will fill me and help me to control that so that I can assess the situation and then respond accordingly in the power of the Holy Spirit. But that takes time and experience. It's easy to say, oh yeah, I don't fear. But the reality is, you don't know that until you go through something. You know? But I want you to understand this, and this is so neat, that God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen. So he's there to hold your hand through the whole thing. Yes. He's holding your hand through the whole thing. You might not feel it, and you might not see it, but he's holding your hand. And that's a matter of faith that you have to believe that he's doing that. A lot of the things that we believe as, as born-again Christians is a matter of faith. And when we activate our faith in God, then we see the results of that faith uh, as we go through things. Um, someone was just telling me the other day that they're faithful to tithe and that um, all of a sudden they... They um, got a certain amount of uh, money. Oh, yeah, it was Jack. And all of a sudden, they got a certain amount of money refund, and it was enough to pay their, their bill, their medical bill. You know, And it was like, wow, because that happened to us too. Mm -hmm. And see, for me, that's like it happened to him, happened to me. Same God. Yeah. That works the same way. Mm -hmm. So it, just, it strengthens my faith. And I'm sure it's happened to a lot of other people too. And it's just the same God uh, that is uh, existing out there. So we don't have to fear but yet it takes some time to truly uh, put your faith in God. Is it a lack of faith when you do fear? Yes. yes. I mean, that's the truth. You're, you're, you're not trusting God. Really. Yeah. yeah, but I don't, I, you don't understand. You know, I don't like what he's going to do, or I don't like the way it's going to happen. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have to trust God. Therefore, verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God. Again, he's writing from prison. So Paul's saying, I don't have any fear at all. And not only that, I'm sharing the gospel while I'm here in prison. So he says, the son of God who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Wow, that's amazing. It's not according to our works, but it's the work of Jesus. Yeah. Ephesians 2.8, right? For by 
grace, you have been saved through faith. That's it. Mm. And not of works, at least you can boast. And so he's making it very clear that God has saved us before time even began. He knew who his were because his put their faith in Christ Jesus. If they don't put their faith in Christ Jesus, uh, then they're not his. They're not his. He goes on, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. So again, God has revealed this through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he literally noticed this observation, who has abolished death. Who's abolished death? The work of Jesus Christ. Yes. Death has no stings. Corinthians chapter 15, 50 something right around there. Death, oh, oh death, where is your sting? Mm -hmm. There's no sting anymore. Death has no sting for the Christian. And we can have confidence in that. We can have confidence in that. That absent from the body is present, present from the Lord, Lord, Galatians says. Yes. And so it's through our Savior, Jesus Christ, alone. Does that mean all of the religions are wrong? Well, let me say this very clearly. Yes. <laughs> Is it because I'm saying that? No, because God said that. Again, John 14, 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one goes to the Father that is God in heaven except through me. There's only one name, uh, Acts 4, 12, I believe, or 4, 17, uh, 12, says there's only one name under heaven given among men by which we are saved. And that name is the name of Jesus Amen. Christ. I mean, the revelation even says that one day every knee, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Now that means everyone's going to stand before God. And those that know him, they're going to confess him as Lord. And those that don't know him, they're going to confess him as Lord as he separates them from heaven and sends them to hell, unfortunately. But that doesn't have to be the case if we humble ourselves before the Lord. So he goes on and says, verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. How important is that? The observation here is that keep the theological doctrines of God. Believe them and keep them and make them your own. It's so important that we understand this. Christians should be in unity and not divided when it comes to the word of God. The reason we're divided is because we're not <clears throat> reading our word. And so someone will come up to me and says, well, I disagree with you. Why? And then they give me this secular answer. It's a worldly answer. It's an answer that doesn't come from the Bible. So obviously they're not reading their Bible and obviously they don't believe their Bible. And they believe the secular world or their own feelings or emotions. They're living by sight and not by faith. And the Apostle Paul here says that, this, that sound doctrine is important, that we understand the teachings of God in the Bible. And this is why God has given us this word. James says that we should be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Jesus, when he was tempted on the pinnacle, and, and Satan came and said, you know, why don't you... Uh, turn these stones into bread and eat, you know? <clears throat> and I love Michael's answer. He's Jesus said, uh, man shall not live by scones alone, but by the word of God. <clears throat> scones are the Starbucks things, <laughs> but man shall not live by stones alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we need to, and by the way, that's bread. <laughs> We need to live by the word of God. It's so important. I mean, God has given us this word. It has, it has been tried and tested throughout time. Here's a principle that I use uh, quite often when someone says, well, we can't believe that doctrine in the Bible because uh, it just came about the last hundred years or so. You know, like, for instance, the rapture. You'll hear guys say, well, the rapture never was taught until a hundred years ago, so it's a false doctrine. Excuse me? It's written in the Bible, which is more than 100 years old. Go to the source. Don't go to when men finally understood it. Go to the source. It's always been there. It's been a mystery that's just been hidden from man until all of a sudden it's understood. So 
just very clearly, the Bible has everything that, that we need to know uh, about life and situations. So he goes on. Uh, this you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are uh, Phygelius and Hermogenes. Uh, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesimus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. Um, Paul obviously suffered heartache as he poured into people and they left him. Uh, they went away from him. As he said, they have turned away from me. Now he doesn't say from the gospel. He doesn't say from Jesus. He says they've turned away from me. So we don't know if that suggest and maybe it's suggested in the writing that they're not believers anymore but we do know that they turned away from the apostle paul and they've gone another place and we can use the example of mark you know when paul says no in the beginning he's too young he's kind of kind of not there not faithful and so forth so i'm not taking him in a sense and so he's kind of gone away from me at that moment so it could be that these Men just are no longer with Paul, and he's saying they've turned away from me. But it seems to be in a negative sense there. Uh, that's the observation. Interpretation, yeah, men will always turn away from you. They're not going to be as faithful as other men. Um, and then you have men that are faithful, like Onesimus, you know. And so it's the men that are faithful that you pour into. Uh, I've wasted, and probably Paul would agree to, a lot of time thinking about those other men trying to figure out why and accusing, and accusing yourself and condemning yourself. And, and it's just a lot of wasted time, a lot of wasted time. And I'm at the point now where if someone begins to disagree and it becomes such an issue, I'm like, you know what, see you later, bye, go. I have other people that are here and really wanna learn. You know, Chuck would say that that sometimes people would come and say, Pastor Chuck, I, I have a question. And he says, oh, I'm always ready for a question. What's your question? You know, and they'd ask the question. And then he'd go to explain and they start arguing with him. And he goes, oh, obviously they don't have a question. They want to debate. And so he says, God bless you. And he walks away. He says, doesn't want to waste his time on that. I don't waste his time on that. You know, he's got a lot of people in his church. And I, I felt like that just yesterday, arguing with somebody after I just shared a, sh a short message, you know, about let's not argue you know, let's be in unity. And they kept, well, we're not arguing. We're, we're discussing. <laughs> Same as arguing. And there was a point I said, I'm done. Bye. See you later. What are you going away? Yep. Bye. See you later. I'm, I'm not going to argue the point. It's just the way it is. And that's just the way it is. So you accept it or you don't. And that's just the way it is. So that's going to always happen. That's the application. That's, that's the interpretation. What's the application? Don't spend, t don't waste your time. Move on because it will just drag you down. Verse 18, the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me in Ephesus. So Onesimus was a blessing. And of course, he got um, the prayers of Paul for him. And there's some men here that are blessings to me. You know, uh, Randy's such a blessing. He's been here for a long time. He's so faithful. And we communicate. You know, he, he tells me how he's feeling. In fact, the other day, I just... I said, so Randy, what's going on? I just throw that. What's going on? <sighs> just really busy. I go, I can see that. I can see that in you. You're just all over the place right now. And sometimes you're, you're short with me. So I just wanted to make sure we're okay. Yeah, no, we're, we're fine. It's just a lot going on. Okay, good, good. So we, you know, we're on the same page, you know. Carlos the same way, you know. He's becoming somebody that I can depend upon, you know. Um, Jesse, a young man who, what, from junior high, raised here and that guy is faithful to this ministry he had a great talk with him yesterday uh, we spent a good half an hour or so talking about ministry and and purpose and so forth and you know just to hear him and the confidence uh that he has in this ministry and, and calling here and so forth so uh, we have some faithful men here and i want to spend time and i'll be spending time with them i'll be going away with them um here uh, in a couple of weeks and, and hopefully just get to know them more and spend more time with them and get our hearts even more knitted together. You know, uh, you can knit your heart together with certain threads. Uh, they, there's thread numbers, right, in, in cloths. 
you can have thread numbers. And so the, the tighter, the more thread it is, the stronger that material is, right? You get, you get less threads and it's a weak material, but you get more threads, more knitted together, and it's a strong material. It doesn't rip as easy. And that's what I hope to do. So let's pray. Gracious Father, uh, there's so many here in the church, Lord, that we are getting to know and hoping, Lord, that we will uh, join together and be knitted together, Father, uh, for your glory, Lord. Not necessarily just for the building of this ministry, to have numbers or for financial reasons, Lord, but because we want to first glorify you. And we want to have relationships with one another that are based upon <clears throat> our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, upon his word and his doctrine, and upon mutual respect for one another, and definitely, Lord, for love for the gifts that you have given to each of us and respecting those gifts and places that we all uh, serve in, Lord. And we just continue to pray that you will do that, Father. And give me the wisdom, Father, and the strength and the time, Lord, to pour into those people that are here that are faithful, Father, that we may glorify you, Lord. Bless your people today, Lord, as they begin their day. Go with them, Father. Bless them, lead them, guide them, Lord, every step of the way. And Lord, don't leave them or forsake them. You promised that. And so let them sense your presence, Lord, every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you have any prayer requests, post them. If, if you want to, go ahead and private message me and we're going to take time to pray for your day and for ours here. So have a wonderful day. And again, we won't be here Wednesday. We'll see you on um, Friday. God bless.